These are the best spring bars I've ever seen. And I think that says a lot about the watches that we're going to be looking at today because basically every single component, every aspect, every design choice has been made very meticulously, very carefully. And I don't think I've ever seen this level of attention to detail put into a watch. Today we're going to be taking a look at a pair of watches that are a collaboration between a small Korean watch shop and Squale. Let's take a look. Hey guys, welcome back to Just The Watch. My name's Dave and I love to collect affordable watches. And today's kind of a treat because we're not looking at what I would classify an affordable watch. Every once in a while I like to jump outside of kind of our normal price range and check out what you can get if you spend a little bit more money or a lot more money. And with these watches being priced at $1,500, that makes them the most expensive watches that I've featured here on the channel so far. And it also makes one of these the most expensive watch that I now own, because full disclosure, What a Watches did allow me to keep one of the two watches. They said I could pick one to keep, which is why you saw the paid promotions flag at the beginning of this video. However, as usual, other than the watch itself, What a Watches did not provide any compensation for this review, nor did they have any input into the content of the review. And with this channel having a focus strongly on the affordable end of the segment, you know, typically trying to stay under $500, I think it's really interesting to kind of see, yeah, what you can get for more money. And obviously one of the questions that I often have and I've always tried to figure out myself is, you know, is there really a, a huge difference between these watches sort of in this above $1,000 range or, you know, getting even higher into that uh, versus these affordable watches? And while that's not going to be the focus of this video today, having one of these watches in hand is going to allow me to make some in-depth comparisons in the future, so that will definitely be a future video. Now, What a Watches has produced two of these special edition watches with Squale. One is a black dial, one is a white dial. They are both limited runs. I think there's 500 pieces of the black dial and 300 of the white dial. And the white dial is just about to come on sale. It might be on sale on their site now. They've named the black dial the Corso Italiano and the white dial the Artico. Today's video is going to focus on the Artico. These watches have a very vintage design to them. They're harkening back to some of the classic dive watches from the 1960s era. And what watches in Squale have pulled it off perfectly. These are some of the most beautiful dive watches I've ever seen. They look like they came straight out of the 1960s and yet they have a more modern case size, modern materials with sapphire crystal and an ETA 2824 movement inside of it, as well as a really robust solid 300 meters of water resistance. When you talk about these in comparison to more affordable watches, I think there were three things that really stood out to me that kind of elevate this above what you typically find in that under $500 price range. One is the really stunning case design, and that's something that Squale is famous for. Another is just the overall level of kind of fit and finish and polish, combined with really high-end components, uh, going with everything from those spring bars that I mentioned to the strap selections and even the packaging that these watches came in. And the third thing is the history and heritage that is behind these watches. In those three areas in particular, they really far surpass any of the watches that I've featured on this channel. Now there's two things in the design of this watch that I think really kind of highlight the really cool heritage and history that went into this watch. The first is the double logo. You have a Squale logo at both 12 and 6 o'clock. And the second is that it looks an awful lot like a Blanc Pond 50 Fathoms. And both of these design choices are very deliberate nods to important aspects of Squale's history. Let's take that double logo, for instance. When Squale got their start, they were known primarily as a case manufacturer, not as a watchmaker. Back in those days, it was a lot more common for watch manufacturers to kind of outsource different aspects of the watch, and Squale was renowned for making some of the best waterproof cases for dive watches around. And to this day, when people talk about Squale watches, they often refer to them by the case number designations. The watches we're looking at here today are based off of Squale's Sub-39 case, which itself is based off of one of Squale's early cases from the 1960s. Now, back in those days, Squale's case cases were so well known for their quality and their water tightness that when a watch manufacturer would use a Squale case in one of their designs, they would actually put Squale's logo down at 6 o'clock. 
So you'll find a lot of these early watches having a double branding. They'll have the watch manufacturer's logo at 12 o'clock, and then they'll have the Squale kind of shark logo down at 6 o'clock, indicating that this watch has a Squale case in it. So eventually, when Squale got around to making their own watches, they kind of kept this tradition up, and they would double brand their watches. They would put Squale at the 12 o'clock, indicating that they were the manufacturer of the watch, and they would put their Squale logo at the 6 o'clock, indicating that it had a Squale case. So it's a fun nod to their history back when they used to make cases for other big-name watch manufacturers. And they made some watch cases for some pretty well-known brands. They made watch cases for Doxa, Hoyer, which would later become Tag Hoyer, and as you've probably already figured out by now, Blanc Pond as well. And when you're talking about dive watches, there's not many brands that have a higher level of heritage than Blanc Pond. Blanc Pond really pioneered the dive watch, and a lot of people have argued that they were the manufacturers of the first true dedicated dive watches. The 50 Fathoms was hugely iconic and continues to be one of the most recognizable dive watches out there. And some of those 50 Fathoms models from the 70s used Squale cases. And that's why I think it's so kind of cool and interesting that this watch is going back and really drawing its design influence from these early vintage 50 Fathoms watches because Squally was a part of that story and that history. In some ways, it almost feels like this watch is kind of half homage and half reissue. Now, the history is a little bit murky here. I don't believe that Squale and Blanc Pond ever collaborated on a watch that looked quite like this. I think their collaborations started more in the 70s where designs had moved on. But the case of this watch is based off of one of Squale's designs from the 60s. And it's a style of case that wouldn't look out of place at all on one of Blanc Pond's vintage 50 Fathoms from that time period. And overall, the design just looks absolutely fantastic and really plays on this kind of fascinating history and interplay between these two companies. But this particular watch has a third company involved in it, and that's Wada Watches. Wada Watches is one of Squale's Korean distributors. They run their own watch shop in Korea, and they're uh, an authorized dealer for a lot of different watch brands. But they've also designed a number of watches in collaboration with other major watch brands. With the Artico and the Corso Italiano, they went back to Squale's recently released 60th anniversary watch, which was a limited edition that was released in 2019. That watch introduced this Sub-39 case from Squale. To produce this new case, Squale went back to their archives and they found a vintage case from the 1960s. And that one, I believe, was like a 34, 35 millimeter case. And so essentially what they did is they kind of scaled it up to 39 millimeters. And when they did that on the 60th anniversary version and on the normal Sub-39 case that Squale sells on their site, it has 22 millimeter lugs. The original case was like 34, 35 millimeters, and I think it had an 18 millimeter strap. So when they sized it up to 39 millimeters, it came out to having proportionally a 22 millimeter strap, which is what they went with. And while it was somewhat admirable that they kept the proportions true to that vintage watch case, I kind of felt like that 22 millimeter lug width looked a little bit awkward on that 39 millimeter case. And I think that must have been a common sentiment among watch fans because when what watches went to create this collaboration, they asked Squale to make the case with 20 millimeter lugs and a slightly shorter lug to lug distance. They also had a very specific Blanc Pong 50 Fathoms model that they wanted to kind of reference that had triangular indexes on it and a no date dial. So that was another change that was made. On Squale's sub 39 watches, they have a, a date at three o'clock. This one's a no date version. And then finally, they changed the movement over from the Sleeta SW200 to an ETA 2824-2. Now, as you guys probably know, I, I tend to always prefer watches with dates on them. And yeah, for a daily watch, I'd rather have a date. But I completely understand the choice of going with the no date on here. I think that the no date option looks better. It really maintains the symmetry better. And I think that's just largely a personal preference thing. But I gotta say, the end result of kind of all of this history and collaborations and influences all coming together is really a very stunning watch. Dimensions and specifications on both the black and white dial are pretty much the same. In both cases, you are getting a 39 millimeter case, but actually it's a 40 millimeter bezel, so it kind of wears more like a 40 millimeter. 20 millimeter lugs, 47 millimeters lug to lug, 12.3 millimeters thick, 300 meters of water resistance, a sapphire crystal, and the bezel insert is a K1 mineral crystal, so not a sapphire bezel insert. For movement, you have the ETA 2824-2, and pricing on these comes in at 1,499 for the Artico for the white dial version, and 1,599 for the Corso Italiano or the black dial version. Now that $100 price difference is due primarily to the leather strap. On the black dial, they package it with the Shell Cordovan Horween leather strap. 
Now you can add that as an option to the Artico to the white dial, which costs you $109, essentially making the price identical between the two. And one of the main reasons they decided to go with 20 millimeter lugs on this watch is to give you a lot of strap options. So I'm gonna be showing you it on a couple of different straps as we go along. And I'll also swap that shell cord and strap from the black dial version over to the white dial so you can see what it looks like if you wanna go for that option. All right, let's jump in and talk about some of the design elements that I really like about this watch, starting with the case. The case on this watch is absolutely gorgeous. The lugs have this kind of elegant curve to them that sort of swoops out from the mid case. And they have just a wonderful shape to them as well. The lugs have a nice gentle curve going over the wrist that makes it conform to your wrist very well and it's just really comfortable. And the case shape allows the bezel to be very easily gripped. And the action on the bezel is just fantastic. It has a very solid feel to it, and yet it's very smooth to turn with nice gentle clicks as you go around. It does 120 click unidirectional rotating bezel. The bezel has a glossy black inlay with a loom pip triangle at 12 o'clock, and then a K1 mineral crystal insert covering it to protect it. The crystal, however, is sapphire, and it is a really beautiful sapphire crystal. It provides some really kind of cool distortions at the very extreme edges of the dial. The outline of the crystal and the polished edges on the top of the bezel really catch the light in really cool ways. You get these kind of rings of light circling around the dial. And that's something that I think just overall, when you, know, when you look at this watch, it just is such a beautiful watch. Like it almost looks as beautiful as a dress watch, but it doesn't look at all like a dress watch. It looks like a dive watch. You kind of get the best of both worlds where it feels like a special occasion every time you put the watch on. And yet it's not this fragile thing. It's a, it's a pretty tough and rugged watch that can take anything you can throw at it. Now basically everything on this watch is kind of high polish and that goes with the case as well. It's almost a mirror-like look to the degree that when you set it down on a surface like on a wooden table or something, it reflects whatever it's been set down on. And yeah, that does bring up the concern of getting scratches on it, so that's something to be aware of. But if you're the kind of guy who likes to wear your watches and you think the battle scars only enhance the beauty of them, and give them some personality, you're not gonna have a problem with that. Dial on the Artico is not a stark white. It has a little bit of creaminess to it, kind of an off-white color, and a very subtle, almost paper-like texture. I think texturing on dials is something that's hard to get exactly right, and the texture on this one is done perfectly. It's interesting without being in your face, and all of the printing on it is excellent. Just a really great looking dial that you can kind of dive into and appreciate. The hands are cut extremely finely. They have a great bevel to them and they're high polished. Now, other than the strap choices, there are a couple of other differences between the white and black dial versions of this watch. Obviously you have a different color scheme and what's really important to note about that is also two very different loom formulations. On the black dial, they've gone with this sort of old radium look where it's kind of a patinaed light brown that glows green in the dark, really matches the vintage theme of this watch. But they've gone a completely different direction with the loom on the white dial. Now the loom on the Artico is exceptional and really unlike anything that I've seen before. The triangular indexes and the Arabic numerals are kind of on the thin side. They don't give you a lot of um, area to put a lot of loom on here. So you typically wouldn't expect it to be that bright. And when I first saw this in the dark, I mistakenly thought it was BGW9 because it glows kind of a bright blue. But according to what a watch is, this is actually not BGW9, it's Blue C3, which is something I didn't even know existed. So I believe this is a fairly new formulation that Superluminova has come up with. It's supposed to be at least 5% brighter than BGW9 and to have a truer blue glow to it. And in the dark, it looks really cool. It does seem to have kind of a purer blue to it than BGW9. And indeed, it is very bright, but it's not the kind of thing that really jumps out at you again because the, you know, the area isn't that large. It doesn't have these like giant loom plots on it. It just has the very elegant triangular indexes and that 12 o'clock marker. So I was really curious to put this to the test. So I grabbed my Ativo from Vesuviet, which uses BGW9, and threw that in here up against it. And while there are other factors in here besides the loom formulation, you know, the, the number of layers of loom that's applied also plays a huge role in the brightness. And I don't know how many layers each of these watches have, so you can't make quite a direct comparison, but the Artico did substantially outshine the BGW9 on the Vesuvia. In fact, it scored a 10 on my J-score scale, which means that it is just as bright as my Seiko Samurai, which again was really impressive given the small size of each of these loom markers on there. The watch remained very legible after the one hour test. And all in all, I gotta say, this is one of my favorite loom profiles that I've seen. It's just, it's not like a super overpowering kind of thing, but it's very bright, very elegant, and it just functions perfectly. 
And I'll be curious to see if more watches kind of switch over to using this blue C3 instead of BGW9 in the future. And the final difference between these two watches is the packaging that they come in. The black dial version comes in a really stunning portable watch case. It's a, it's a wooden watch case that's handmade in Japan. Well, the Artico comes in kind of a more standard Squale watch roll. Now, a couple of things that I found a little bit awkward about this watch. One is that it appears that there is a ghost date position on the crown when you're setting it. This watch features an ETA 2824-2 movement, which is excellent. It's a great movement choice for this watch. ETA movements are a little bit harder to find than the Swiss Salidas and generally held in a little bit higher regard. Typically, the 2824 does have a date position on it, and this is a no-date watch, but it feels like they've somehow disengaged the date from this watch. So you do have a date position on the crown, uh, but normally with a ghost date, you can, you can feel the date clicking when you spin it in that position. I couldn't detect that at all. And speaking of the crown, it's a very elegant looking crown. It's kind of a diamond shape. It looks great. I like the aesthetics of it, but particularly when it's fully screwed in, it kind of nuzzles underneath the bezel a little bit. And for me, it was hard for me to kind of grip it and unscrew it. Finally, I'm not sure why they went with a K1 mineral crystal insert on the bezel instead of sapphire. Sapphire bezel inserts are getting pretty common in watches that I review in the $500 range. So I would have expected to see that here. One consideration is that mineral crystal tends to be more shatter resistant than sapphire but less scratch resistant. And maybe the thinness of the bezel insert would have made a sapphire insert too fragile for that purpose. I don't know, but yeah, was a little confused to see that there. The only thing I think that could have actually been improved on this watch is I would have liked to have seen drilled lugs on here. I think that fits a little bit better with the vintage aesthetic and it makes strap changes a little bit easier. So you might argue that the drilled lugs might kind of break up those really beautiful lugs that they have on this. But for practicality and kind of really leaning into that vintage theme, I would have liked to have seen that implemented on this watch. But other than that, I have been pretty much completely blown away by these watches. I mean, all the history and heritage aside, having the actual watches in hand, they just look absolutely amazing on the wrist. And yeah, it just feels like a special occasion every time you put them on. Now, evaluating the value of these watches is a little bit difficult for me because, again, I don't have a lot of experience with this price range. But we can look at some comparable ones out there, most noticeably Squale's own Sub-39 designs. So if you get a stock Sub-39 from Squale, those run around $1,299. So these two watches are running at two and $300 above kind of the base Squale Sub-39s. But the only way you're going to get a Sub-39 case with 20 millimeter lugs right now is with these special editions. And I think for a lot of people, that alone is going to make the extra cost worthwhile, not to mention all of the cool little extras and design tweaks that they've made to it. Now, if you want to look outside of Squale, you can also find Oris Diver 65 watches in around the same price range. And you can also sometimes find the Longines Legends Diver for around this price as well. Both of those also have a strong vintage character coming from really respected historical watch brands. So I'll leave it up to you guys to kind of decide between all of those. For me, it's just been really fun to kind of get some firsthand experience with these sort of more expensive watches. And it's been so much fun to kind of dive into the history behind them. And I'll be looking forward to spending some more time with them going forward so I can make some more comparisons between, yeah, watches in this tier and some more affordable ones. Maybe we'll look at some other alternatives back down in that sub $500 price range. If you're interested in content like that, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Also, if you're interested in a watch themed t-shirt like this one that I'm wearing here, you can pick that up on my shop. Finally, drop me a comment down below. Let me know what you think of these particular watches. Um, give me your opinion of Squale in general. I've heard that there's some controversy around the brand and you know some people love them, some people hate them. Uh, they've left an incredibly good first impression on me with these watches, but that's gonna wrap it up for me today. Thanks for watching and we'll see you guys later. Bye.